Let's go. So what's up, everybody? Thanks for clicking this video. Thanks for tuning in on Spotify to Cinema Crossroads. Thanks for checking out my channel, Simon Hill Keeps It Trill. And I know you're subscribed to Backpack Bandits on YouTube. This is episode 33 of Simon and Acti on X Movie Reviews. And today we are covering the illustrious film by Tyler Perry. But before we get into that, say hi, boo. Hi everyone, I'm Akti, I'm from Turkey, and I'm here to review this disappointing movie. Ooh, starting off strong, starting off strong. <laughs> now, I don't know why, but for some reason, usually we watch a movie once and we're pretty good to talk about it. But for some reason, I don't know if it was just circumstance or just because we wanted to torture ourselves, we watched this movie like three and a half, two and a half times. <laughs> like, yeah. I don't know why we did that. So you watched it first by yourself, right? Yeah. And then we watched it together. And then I watched it a little bit today just to like refresh my mind on the story in certain scenes. And we were giving commentary while I was eating dinner. But overall, how did you feel about this film that stars Kelly Rowland? It's an erotic thriller slash drama uh, placed in Chicago. Yeah. What did you think about it? Uh, first of all, <laughs> I want, I would like to admit something mm. and I'm sorry that I, I am like this, but I confused Tyler Perry with Jordan Peele and I thought this movie was directed by Jordan Peele. So I actually watched this movie for the first time thinking it's going to be great. And I'm thinking like, oh, like Kelly Rowland is in it and you know, he does great movies and stuff. And then I watched it and then I was like, wait. Like, how did he do this? Jordan yeah. Healy. I'm thinking in my head, like, this cannot be real. How would the same guy who directed Get Out would do this? Yeah. But then, yeah, like, today I realized by, like, asking you. Yeah. <laughs> I realized that it was Tyler Perry. <laughs> and then everything made sense. Now, this same storyline directed by Jordan Peele might be more interesting or if he had input on the screenplay. Uh, but I feel like why this movie suffers is because of Kelly Rowland's flat acting in the beginning of it, or at least like two thirds of the movie. And then overall, the movie has no theme. It's just a story like this happened. Right. Like yeah. somebody's just made up something and put it on screen without mm -hmm. any bigger commentary and i understand that films can have like they can just be entertaining and they can just be stories right but uh this movie is very tubi-esque right and you and i we watched a tubi movie before we watched uh it's called uh he's for the streets right you remember that yeah and i feel like that movie is better than this one because number one like you know everybody there is like an amateur actor actress you know, the, the setting is very bad. It's very jilted in its, you know, production value and stuff like that. But there's some endearing quality to it. You know what I mean? It's like, it's cheap, but it's trying. And so you appreciate it. But this feels expensive and they're not even trying. Does that make sense? Yeah. And also like, while we were watching that 2B movie, mm. it's like funny without being, you know, without meaning to be funny. But this movie is not even like funny like that. This movie is just, I don't know, like very average. I don't know. It feels like a friend sat down and told me like, this is what happened to me, girl. And yeah, and there's like, like you said, there's no message in it. And I also think like, honestly, like I, I don't think it's the most of it, it was the actors and actresses fault. I feel like also like the script was bad too because like their lines were sort of very mediocre, like just, I don't know, weird. Yeah, yeah. Like um, like in He's for the Streets, there are parts that are funny. Like when grandma does the TikTok dance, remember that? Yeah. <laughs> I feel like this movie would be helped if it did inject some comedy because Tyler Perry is kind of good at, at comedy. You know, for a certain demographic. What do you think? Could this movie have been helped by a few jokes in there? Yeah, definitely. Like two or three moments of jokes, maybe. That would yeah. be like great. Yeah. And I think they they had, maybe they should have had those moments. Yeah, like for example, when Mia, Kelly Rowland's character and Charlize, mm. 
Mm-hmm. Um, they were like the two girls that were like, you know, their the their mother in laws hates them. Mm-hmm. You know, they could have had jokes between them or something. I don't know. You know, yeah, like yeah. mother in law jokes or husband jokes or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like when they were sitting down at the table and the mom made them sit down at the far end, she they could have said something like, look at this white lady making us sit at the back of the bus. And she could have said, what? What did you say? Nothing. <laughs> yeah, I know. Like, And instead, like, it's just like, hey, girl, are you okay? What would I do? Like, what did I deserve you to have as a best friend? Like, what is that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's such a cliche line. Yeah. Like, the movie takes itself a bit too serious. And I don't know if Tyler Perry is aiming for that, like if he wants to start making more serious films, because like I said, he got his big break and he earned his millions dressing up like a woman, making comedy movies for like church folk and stuff like that. And now he's getting into erotic thrillers. And listen, I appreciate a growth and like an, an evolution, but get some help, man, get some help, (laughs) get help to do it. I know, I know, like, yeah, like you said, I appreciate, like, as a man, I appreciate him trying to do, like, this sexual thriller, erotic thriller, Uh, it's definitely, like, probably something out of his comfort zone, and I feel like today, thriller, like, a good appreciate, like, a, a thriller that we appreciate has to be, like, very intricate, Mm-hmm. like the ones that Jordan Peele does, for example. Yeah. Uh, it should have, like, symbolism and stuff like that, and this just wasn't there. Like, it didn't have any symbolism. It was just, like, flat out there. Yeah, just a flat story, right? And it's sort of like an unbelievable story, too, because we're supposed to believe this high-powered, very successful lawyer woman can so easily be manipulated by so many what looks like mediocre men in her life. Like her husband is sort of a loser. The artist guy, he might have a little bit of his stuff together, but he's a playboy who, you know, does grimy stuff with his dick and puts paint in his booty crack. (laughs) Wow. Yeah, he doesn't have anything together. He's like a suspected killer. Yeah. And so we're supposed to believe that this woman could so easily be, you know, whipped up by his charms. A charm that he doesn't have, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. The, like, honestly, acting as a woman, like, it, are any of these guys in this movie appealing? Yeah, no, I'm not ever going to fantasize with, like, getting in bed with a woman killer. Like, I know in the end he didn't end up being that person, but I think at the time Maya was thinking that he was the killer uh-huh. because everything directed at him. So if I'm thinking that about somebody, I'm not going to have sex with them, no. Yeah. I'm and, yeah, the yeah. husband was, like, a... We call it light uh, bread men in Turkish. <laughs> like the diet, you know, he's a diet product. He's not for the real people. Mm. Interesting, interesting. So that's a very interesting phrase in Turkish, a light bread man. Like you're not fully there, like you're not. Yeah, like, you know, you know how like diet stuff has like lower calories and stuff mm. like that. So yeah, like. You're not a real bread. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're like those tasteless, you know, useless diet breads. I like now, what, now watching this movie, I was thinking like, who is this supposed to appeal to? And a second thing I was thinking about is like, because this is an erotic thriller, can it succeed in Netflix? Like, of course on Netflix, you can have sex scenes and you can curse and stuff like that. But, like, there's scenes in this movie, like, when they go underground into the sex club in the apartment, which is weird. Like, what apartment has that a part of the lease contract? Like, (laughs) and, uh, yeah, like, I don't feel like Netflix is a good medium, a good place to have an erotic thriller. Because you can't do as much with sexuality and, and the human body in the Netflix screen. And then I was like, who's watching this? Like, who actually would watch this and say, damn, I got to see that again, or I got to show this to other people, or that was a great film. Like, who is the audience? You get what I'm saying? Yeah, we're all just, like, trapped. (laughs) Nobody watches this intentionally. (laughs) Most people watch it to hate watch it, (laughs) I feel like. And, I mean, it wasn't, like, that, you know, um, that much of, like, sexuality. 
But there were scenes like, yes, it's more than your usual like thriller movie. But it is an erotic thriller, so I think it's not that much when you compare it. Like, I feel like I've seen similar sex scenes in Netflix. Yeah, yeah. I think the big draw of this movie and the people that are wanting to watch this movie is just because Kelly Rowland is such a big, you know, iconic figure. And, of course, she's a beautiful woman, you know? Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so it's just interesting to see her in a main leading role because we haven't seen that before. And yeah, then on definitely. top of that, a lot of people are talking about the sex scene, too. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, like, looking back to, like, letterbox. Uh, reviews of this movie everyone just gave it a one star and wrote like this is for kelly <laughs> <laughs> so yeah like everyone was just like watching it either for kelly or just like to hate on uh tyler perry basically <laughs> and that's a crazy thing right because usually if somebody does something bad like makes a bad movie the hate goes towards them but kelly's brand is so strong that people still show her love, but hate on this movie. Like, I didn't walk away from this movie disliking her. I just saw another Destiny's Child member who couldn't act. <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah, like, some people were criticizing her acting, but nobody, like, really hated her for doing it. Even some people were saying, like, actors did the best they could with this script, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And what did you think about the guy who played Zaire, who is also the same guy who played uh, in Moonlight. And I didn't realize it at first until I watched it on the second watching. Like, I know I've seen this guy before. Like, what do you think about mm -hmm. him as an actor holding it down? Uh, so his name is Trevante Rhodes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know, like, he was normal, I guess. I just really didn't like his character and, like, his lines. Because he was saying everything, like, very slow with pauses in between words. And also, like, just saying, like, replying to Maya with, like, one word or two word answers. <laughs> which was really annoying. And I don't know. I felt like maybe they created a very cliche, bad boy slash depressed artist character. Mm hmm so I think that just the character didn't make me love it. But he was okay. Like, he was better than Kelly, I feel mm -hmm. like, as an actor. But for me, the best actress was Charlize. Shannon yeah. Thornton. Yeah, I love Shannon Thornton. Shout out to P-Valley. We need that season three ASAP. I want to know what happened with her, her white baby daddy, and her uh, baby. I got to know what happens. <laughs> but she, she actually, I feel like she deserves more leading roles because she actually is a great actress. Every time she was in the scene, she delivered her lines well, always looked great, liked her. Yeah, yeah. yeah like they could have switched the roles with Kelly Rowland here. Mm -hmm. But maybe if they did that, this movie wouldn't be such a big hit. Yeah. Because no. Kelly is like more uh, famous. Yeah. But definitely. I think she was like the really only believable character. Like even though we don't see her that much, like, she was this sort of, um, she was playing this, like, silenced, rich wife, mm -hmm. basically. And I think she really, like, embodied her character. I don't know. She was, like, the best one for me. Well, I'm going to say that I liked her husband, the guy who was supposed to be the district attorney who's running for mayor. Ray. Ray, yeah. I really liked how Ray had, like, this cold, calculating, Caesar-like uh, demeanor about him. And uh, the, there was a scene when he was at the kitchen table and um, uh, Mia came there and said, I might be defending Zaire in court. And he said, no, you will not. And shook his head like a little sassy, <laughs> sassy white guy or something. That was cool. And every time he was on scene, I believed him. I liked his character. Mm. I've never seen that guy before on screen, but he's well, actually cool. His name is Nick Sagar mm -hmm. and also Cal, Mia's mm -hmm. husband. Mm -hmm. His name is Sean Sagar, so I think they're related. I don't know if they're brothers or cousins or whatever, mm -hmm. but they're both British. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, they, they, they're they British actors playing American roles. Mm, of course, taking our jobs. Immigrants come in, taking our jobs. <laughs> but back, back to Trevante, I feel like Trevante is a good actor at his core, but he's just not getting the right roles. And I feel like, you know... His character was believable, but it's an 
asshole character, so it makes you not want to like him because his whole thing is just, you know, sleeping with women to get further and further to the top or just his own pleasure. And the way he delivers his lines, it's just very flat. It's not charming. It might be seductive for some women or something like that. But his character reminds me of this character from uh, Black American fiction called Midnight, which was from a book by Sister Soldier. I forgot her name. And in that story, there's this very, you know, muscular, tall, dark skinned black man who is always going through drama, but women love him. And uh, yeah, he's just sort of like uh, a cinemized version of this character, in my opinion. Mm. So, yeah, I, I, I don't know exactly how to say it, but Trevante needs to get a better agent, a better agent. See, this goes to show a black man, even if <laughs> a lot of people think, oh, once, you go, once you're in Hollywood and you kiss a man, you're good for life. But that's not true. He kissed a nigga on screen and has been doing Tyler Perry movie, movies ever since. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he definitely needs to, like, I mean, come on. Like, if you acted in Moonlight, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that has to be, like, that has to mean something. Or at least maybe, like, I mean, I don't know. Like, maybe he just did it because, like, he's friends with Tyler or whatever. I don't know. I'm just looking at his, like, discography. And he actually did, like, pretty good movies. Like, he was in Predator. Mm -mm. Well, Predator is not like a great movie, but yeah, I mean, but better than Mea Culpa, he did yeah. like better than Mea Culpa. Yeah, uh, and he did Bird Box. If anyone okay. saw that one, I didn't see Bird Box, but I heard Bird Box is like a modern horror classic. Mm. And he did the United States versus Billy Holiday. Oh, really? Okay. And uh, it's it sounds really cool. Maybe we should watch this too. It's a thriller musical. Okay. All right. Let me take two things back. He hasn't been doing Tyler Perry movies ever since Midnight. And number two, I don't know if he kissed a nigga in Midnight, but I feel <laughs> like he did. I feel like he did. <laughs> well, he was the character Black. Yeah. Yeah. But let me say something. Like, Quajevene Harris, the girl from uh, Beast of the uh, Southern Wild or something like that, she won an Oscar right? But she hasn't been doing anything big ever since, right? Mm -hmm. So I think I think what it is, if you're in Hollywood, but you got a black ass name like Quajevene or Trevante, <laughs> it's still a hard road. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> that's oh, why, man, I don't that's know. why Kelly Rowland gets it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Denzel is the exception. That's a black ass name. <laughs> well, if, do you remember Maya's friend zone friend? Yeah. His name is Ron Riacco. Okay. Like together. Ron Riacco? <laughs> That's like a... it's written together. Wow. Ron Riacco? <laughs> yes. Ron Riacco Lee. Wow. Wow. Boy, they, <laughs> your, parents, <laughs> your parents are setting you up for a fight. <laughs> they were preparing you for the struggle. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but I'm going to say this. We've been talking about this movie so far without doing the walkthrough, but there's really not that much in the story to really break down. Like, yeah. essentially, the story is about this powerful lawyer lady who's in a tumultuous relationship with her husband. She thinks her husband is cheating. Uh, basically, uh, her brother, her brother-in-law is married to one of her girlfriends, and her and her sister-in-law are cool, but the rest of her husband's family are very distant with her, especially her husband's white mother, right, who's very cold to them. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also this artist in Chicago. His name is Zaire. Uh, what was his last name? You forgot? One second. Okay, Zaire something. The famous Zaire the Malloy. Yeah, Zaire Malloy is the famous actor in Chicago who was recently accused of, like, killing his girlfriend or something like that. And so one day, uh, Mia, who is the main character's name, goes to her office and uh, finds out that Zaire wants her to represent him. And then when she asks, you know, did you kill your girlfriend? He says, hell no, I didn't do it. And then uh, he says uh, something like, uh, you know, they're trying to set me up. And he's like, who? who? The D and he says, the DA. And then he says, then she asks, why would he set you up? And then he says, I don't know. And that's, <laughs> I don't know. But that should have been, this, this whole movie could have been over just with this answer to this one question. Why does the DA 
Mia's brother wants to set you up. But instead, Zaire says, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and so then the next 40, the next hour of the movie is Mia and Zaire, like, uh, basically having this very toxic gaslighting relationship where Mia is trying to figure out, you know, the evidence as to whether he killed this girlfriend or not. The evidence looks very strongly that Zaire did kill Mia. And I'll be honest, while I was watching the movie, I thought Zaire was going to be revealed to be a killer. But um, uh, basically, Zaire and Mia end up having a relationship that's very toxic. They have sex covered in paint, <laughs> which is a big point in the movie. Uh, and then at the end, Mia finds out that Zaire has been sleeping with a lot of different girls and doing the same sort of tricks on her that he did to other women to get what he wants. Zaire says he loves Mia, but Mia doesn't believe it. Uh, Mia basically get, uh, you know, goes on a trip to like clear her mind and finds out that the girl who was supposedly killed is alive and well, alive and well in like the Dominican Republic or whatever. Uh, she calls her uh, district attorney brother-in-law who's prosecuting Zaire and says he, she found the woman. He tells her to come back to Chicago and she comes back to the district attorney brother's house. And when she gets there, she finds out actually that the DA, her brother-in-law, his wife, uh, Charlize, slept with Zaire. And ever since then, he's been pissed about it. And so <laughs> he's been on a warpath trying to get Zaire in jail for cucking him. <laughs> and now that uh, Mia found out, basically, her husband's family tries to kill her. She escapes. She ends up, uh, while escaping, killing her husband. And then all that crate, all the, the corrupt political family that is her in-laws goes to jail. And that's the end of the story, right? That's the, that's the entire movie in a nutshell. Um, yeah. Uh, what did you think about that? Uh, yeah, that was uh, very painful to watch. <laughs> Definitely, it didn't have to be two hours. I think this could have been like a... I think this if this was like an hour 20 or something like that, hour 15, it would have been much better and maybe like it would have been more bearable. There were mm -hmm. like definitely scenes that didn't make any sense at all. Like mm -hmm. the scene where Maya... Like the scene where um, the guy, Zaire, decides to go out and then he mm -hmm. goes down to his garage basement and mm -hmm. there's a sex dungeon club mm -hmm. where everyone is like just having weird sex. Mm -hmm. And then like, Ke and then Maya is just like there and she sees everything and then gets out. And like, mm -hmm. she never questions, never asks like what he was doing there. Mm -hmm. Never asks if he owns a sex club. Like, why <laughs> was that there? Like, that's so weird. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, like, the scene where they take the motorcycle ride, like, you know, definitely unnecessary. Didn't mean anything. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, definitely certain scenes could have been snipped, like you said. Like, the sex scene point was one that could have been interesting, but if it never happened, the story would have continued. Motorcycle ride, same thing, just like you said, right? Yeah, so... Yeah, and, like, also that whole sex scene, like, okay, she founds out, like, she assumes that her husband cheated on her, right? Uh -huh. But then you're going to go up and have sex with this man who was just having sex with another girl. Like, literally right in front of her having sex with another girl. Yeah, like, that's <laughs> dirty as fuck. I'm sorry, but... It was, it was wild dirty. That's When I saw that last night, when we watched this movie for the first time, right, I was like... You saw this acting by yourself and you didn't think to mention that part because you brought up the sex scene part where they have sex and paint, but you didn't mention how they got there. Like they got there when he was, she, he was getting ridden by like some Romanian streetwalker <laughs> and they were having like soundless sex. Like literally there was no sound, no moaning, no nothing. It was just like up, down, up, down. Then the Romanian girl gets up, walks away, and then Kelly and this guy proceed to get busy. I was like, what? That's that's wild gross. Yeah, that's how you get AIDS. Like, <laughs> I don't know. It's like gross. That was gross. And also, like, we were earlier joking about this. Like, where did this the other lady go? Because, yeah. like, 
they start making out and then Mia says, no, I can't do this. And then they take a motorcycle ride and they mm -hmm. come back and they have paint sex in the living room. Mm -hmm. So where's this other lady? Yeah. <laughs> in the yeah, she's, meanwhile, like she's on the balcony, like filing her fingernails. Yeah. Like <laughs> it was insane. Like some scenes really didn't make sense at all. Yeah. I think the part of the movie that makes it strange is that there is a murder mystery story here. But the murder mystery sort of gets forgotten in between the awkward flirting, the awkward aggressive flirting that's happening between Mia and Zaire every time they're alone in the studio. But none of the questions are answered as to, okay, how did the girl's blood get into the floor? How did her skull fragments get into the wall? Uh, where did the video come from? Like, they're sort of answered at the end, but they're answered through assumption. Like, you have to assume that the her in-laws family basically beat the girl and then paid her off to disappear, right? But the murder mystery is never followed up. There's never that that Sherlock Holmes moment. You get what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah, no flashbacks. Yeah, I wish yeah. there was like a flashback where Ray and like his mother were planning the whole thing and how it happened. I wish there was like a flashback and stuff like that. And yeah. also like, you know, this whole thing happened in Zaire's house. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, how are you not going to know, like, someone kills another person in your apartment and plants evidence in your painting? Mm -hmm. and, like, how are you not going to know that happened? Aren't you going to, like, question, you know? It, it was just, like, weird, yeah. like, some things. And I think, I don't know, maybe Tyler Perry was trying to make a guilty pleasure movie, like mm -hmm. Mean Girls or something, you know? Mm -hmm. But it was just so bad that it didn't even make the guilty pleasure part. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess maybe the big highlight is the sex scene, but I also feel like the last 20 minutes of the movie are actually pretty good because the outburst scenes, whenever the characters get really angry or emotional, I feel like they were delivered really well. Like there's a scene when Kelly finds out that Zaire was sleeping with a bunch of women and painting them. She gets in the elevator and screams, close the effing elevator. That felt real. Uh, the scene when Cal finds out that Kelly, Kelly, Mia, <laughs> sorry, that Mia cheated on him and he flips the table and goes off, that felt real. Uh, you know, the last fight scene, you know, it felt really real and it tense and you didn't know who was going to come out on top. So there were parts that were engaging for me. Yeah, a little bit. But I felt like I was so um, cinematically hungry <laughs> at those points that at, that's why it felt good to have some good acting or some of those like plot twists. Mm -hmm. You know, because you've been waiting for that for the past one and a half hours. Yeah. So when it picks up now, like, it's okay. Well, mm -hmm. thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I do feel like, though, the movie, because you turn it on and you really just click it to see Kelly Rowland look good or because you just want to see what new thing Tyler Perry has created or whatever reason you're clicking it. I feel like a lot of people watch this not knowing where it was going to go. Like I said before, I really thought Zaire in the end was going to turn out to be a murderer, right? Or maybe Kelly would end up killing him. And that's why the movie title, My Fault, actually was the, you know, the name, the reason for the name, right? But the title doesn't match what the story is because it is titled Mia Culpa. But, you know, Mia didn't do anything that was her fault. Maybe she cheated on her husband. Okay, that could be considered the one thing, but the rest of the story is basically a bunch of people trying to control this girl and, you know, push her in one direction or another and gaslighting this woman, right? And uh, yeah, it, it, the twist at the end was somewhat, how can I say, a little bit satisfying because you're like, okay, you can wrap up some of the things that you've seen, but you know, it the, the story doesn't match like it's it's delivery and it's and it's purpose. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. And it also still doesn't make up for the fact that uh the guy, Zaire, was good. Mm. Like he was still pretty like a bad person because he played the same tricks on every girl. He used like this gallery lady to get like to get famous. 
Mm-hmm. And he tried to like forcefully, almost psychologically forcefully, ha- like tried to have sex with uh, his lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> like he d- just didn't give up until she gave up the, you know, coochie. Yeah, there's a wild line in there when he said, I think I need another lawyer. And Mia says something like, why? And he says, like, my lawyer is refusing to acknowledge that she's attracted to me. Like, what, nigga? (laughs) Or something like that. Like, he is upset his lawyer doesn't want to sleep with him. So now he needs another lawyer. Which makes me think that this whole movie really was put in motion because of one thing. Zaire's desire to smash Mia by any means necessary. So <laughs> for however he found out about her, maybe because he slept with Charlize and saw a picture of uh, Mia on her, you know, uh, screensaver on her iPhone, whatever, he was obsessed with her. And so <laughs> he could have easily said, hey, the DA wants to set me up because I slept with his wife. But nope, he wants to go through the whole drama just to, you know, finally bag his dream girl. He was really a big fan of Destiny's Child. (laughs) Wow, that's funny. But yeah, and also like to think that this woman was so like powerful, one of the best defense attorneys in her state or whatever. I think it was Chicago. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then she would do something like this, like this would, you know, finish her career. Yeah, yeah. Because it's yeah. unethical, like it's against their, you know, laws and stuff like that. So it's like mm-hmm. insane just to get a, you know, urinal infection. <laughs> 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 yes. Oh man, yeah. And, I mean, in in New York Times, they reviewed, mm-hmm. like, they wrote a article about this movie, and they said that the theme of the movie is everyone's guilty of something. Is it really? I mean. I don't know. I didn't feel like guilt was being pushed there. Okay, if we break that down, okay, Cal is guilty or he feels guilty because he's lost the attraction with his wife, right? There's one strong bond is no longer there and he's trying to get that back, but he feels guilty about that. And also he lost his job. Uh, Mia feels guilty because eventually she cheats on her husband. Zaire doesn't really seem to feel guilty because he's always protesting his innocence and he, do- and he seems like he doesn't give a F about anything. But maybe he feels guilty. He got trapped by this Mexican hottie who is now ruining, it, ruining his life, right? Uh, really though? Really? I though? mean, Zaire I feels guilty like about everything he's done with women, I feel like. Because he, he, really? he sort of like scraps them, you know? He doesn't, it doesn't feel like he wants to be in a committed relationship or whatever, which is fine, but he treats women like he wants to do that and then ghosts them or something. I mean, a part of me feels like he wanted to sleep with Mia and also get off of this case. And uh, yeah, at the end of the movie, he does thank Mia Harper. And I forgot if he asked her to like call him or whatever. But uh, yeah, he, she did. She at the ending scene, uh, Maya is holding his her phone, and Zaire texts her, and mm-hmm. it says like, "Hi, Maya. Like, I hope you allow me to see you again, mm-hmm. or something mm-hmm. like that." But Maya like throws her phone in the trash can. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. by the way, who the fuck does that? <laughs> Rich people. <laughs> <laughs> and then she walks away dressed in all black like she's just been out of a funeral. Right, right, right. Maybe Zaire feels guilty. Maybe you can see that theme in there. It just isn't, maybe it's not a powerful enough theme or delivered in yeah, a way. Because the, the delivery's bad. Right, because the only guilt you feel is guilty after watching this movie. Like, why, why did my two hours need to be put towards this? The only guilty person here is Tyler Perry <laughs> for making this movie. But, I mean, yeah. maybe, like, Maya's guilty of cheating. Zaire is guilty of how he th- treats women. Yeah. Charlize also cheated. Ray and Cal and their mom, they're guilty of, like, committing a crime. Uh-huh. And the only person who's not guilty is Jimmy. He's guilty of being in the friend zone and not confessing his I, love to man. I was about to say that. Like Jimmy, this uh, detective who Mia uses to find out information, uh, he, she sends him out in different places to gather uh, stuff about the woman who was killed, but he's coming up empty. 
but we always get this feeling in the movie like he really loves Mia and he actually seems like the most decent of the guys around her. But for some reason, she just has him like with the one arm hug. He's like one arm hug status. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Maybe at the end, maybe they should have like, you know, he should have met with Maya like while the camera is like getting away from the from Maya. Mm -hmm. Instead of, like, us seeing her in all this, like, black clothing, like, with the headscarf and everything, mm -hmm. maybe she could have met this, like, detective guy and there could be a little hint mm -hmm. there. Like, okay, you know, he's the only nice person to her. Not necessarily, like, they have to have a relationship, but at least mm -hmm. as, a, as a friendship, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. It was just, like, a bit flat. Like, the ending was the only good part. Yeah, uh, yeah. But yeah, I don't know. Now, I wanted to know if Charlize survived because at the end of the movie, you know, there's this big fight scene with the mom and uh, her oldest son, uh, you know, trying to kill Mia and Charlize. And they were fighting uh, them off. But I think Charlize got stabbed and then Mia ran out of the house. Now, what do you think? Do you think Charlize survived? Um... I don't think so, because mm -hmm. I feel like if she survived, we would have seen her mm -hmm. while the, like, you know, how this um, reporter is talking and mm -hmm. we see um, Ray, like, mm -hmm. taken away with his handcuffs, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. we don't see, like, Charlie's, like, in the ambulance or whatever, like, near right. the ambulance or whatever. So right. I think she died. Right, right, right. Because I think maybe the reason why Mia was dressed in all black is because maybe Charlize died and Charlize was the only person who could have vindicated her. Uh, but because nobody can say what really happened that night, it's two against one. Mia says, they attacked me. And then they'll say, oh, no, Mia tried to stab us or shoot us. Now she's sort of like on the run now. Yeah, which, yeah. Which would make this a more interesting movie if that was the case, right? Like this guy you know, is now the mayor and he's like, now I want Mia in jail. She's a wanted woman. That would be a, make it more of an erotic uh, tragedy. She got the guy who was innocent off, but then she ended up becoming the guilty uh, person, right? Yeah. Mm. See, there's, there's a film here somewhere. There's a story here somewhere, <laughs> but it just needs a bit more working on. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Like, if this is the idea that Tyler Perry had in mind, I feel like he could have gotten a bit ha more help mm -hmm. by other screenwriters, directors, whatever, like, and then make this, like, actually a compelling story. Yeah. Because the idea is not that bad, and the plot twist works. Mm -hmm. But the other execution was really bad, so the plot twist feels like, huh, you know? It's mm -hmm. just like, a, it doesn't feel like that big moment, it just feels okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I feel like if they, you know, were able to flesh out the theme that, you know, Mia is this successful woman, but she's being brought down by all these men. Like if at the end she had a realization, you know, that all of these people, not that they were trying to kill her, but that they were pulling down her weight, like pulling down her gravity, pulling down her greatness, like her husband was, like Zaire was to some extent. And then she broke free of that or realized that that would be better, right? But it didn't feel like there's any realization. And I feel like, you know, Zaire is just as toxic as Cal or her brother-in-law because like, what does this guy do? All he does is paint like mid-journey type art of women in post-nut clarity, as you said. Like he just paints, you know, very stylistic versions of Instagram posts, of thoughts, right? <laughs> and I feel like he's just, you know, a, that sort of male gaze, uh, voyeur type of artist, not a real true talent. Because I was looking at the art and I'm like, where is, where is the, fin, you know, the, the, the talent here? Where is the thing that sets this guy apart? Like, should we really believe he's this talented artist or is he just, you know, doing watercolors of, of BBWs. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I, I mean, I died when he said mid-journey type <laughs> uh, paintings. Like, that's hilarious. And it was that. It's exactly that. And, like, I don't know. Maybe it would have been more mysterious if they did, like, the an abstract artist or something, you know? Mm -hmm. 
because like there was also this gallery person uh like gallery woman gallery owner mm-hmm. uh who Zaire slept with before mm-hmm. and she w- won't take off his paintings from her walls and there's a protest going on in front of her gallery Uh-huh. Uh but she believes that he is going to be like Picasso or you know Basquiat or whatever one mm. day so that's why she doesn't take them off. Yeah. And I just don't see that. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think that scene with the art gallery woman I think that sort of shows a little bit in the mind of Tyler Perry, right? Cuz like the critics say this is not art. This is almost you know, dangerous art or uh, harmful art, because what you're doing in this film, at least, Tyler Perry, is you're taking, you know, girl boss and destroying her. You're destroying the girl boss in front of our eyes. Please stop. Please stop. Please stop. And then what does Tyler Perry say? All you bitches can go to hell. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? You remember that line when the art when the art yeah. gallery woman said that? Yeah, That's, and she walks out with a middle finger. Yeah, she walks out to the middle finger to the crowd. So we're over here saying, "Please stop, Tyler." And he's saying, "Go to hell. This is what will make me a millionaire. You don't realize it yet, but this will be Picasso." I felt like that was Tyler speaking to the audience honestly. <laughs> I hope it doesn't like end up that way. <laughs> please. Back, Next generations, look, please. We might look back on this film 20 years later. And that might be the new artistic style in film. Like no themes, no you know, really heavy motifs, just story and sex and paint and and big booty men. And nipple covers. And nipple covers. <laughs> yes. Oh God, no. I don't think that will be the case, but if it is, God save us all. Right. Uh yeah, but like yeah, even that like the most interesting scene was maybe like the sex scene or not interesting, but you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Uh just like the scene where we we were supposed to be locked into mm-hmm. the screen. Mhm. Mhm. Cuz yeah, cuz sex sells, right? But even Absolutely. then I was like Kelly Rowland had a nipple patch on, like <sighs> it it looked weird, she looked robotic. I was like where the fuck is her nipple? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh yeah and then like the painting and i'm still thinking like okay this guy just had like sex with an- another person 20 minutes ago and i'm thinking like there's paint like dripping down his uh ass cheeks mm-hmm. and probably dripping down like through his balls into like <sighs> mia's vagina i'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> this is a really bad description. Well, to be fair, to be fair, and I'm going to try to be fair to this movie. It's very likely because Zaire was such a freaky boy that he had erotic body paint just lying around. You know, and they that's a real thing that they do sell. Okay, I didn't know that existed. If yeah. that exists, maybe I'll buy it, but yeah. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> but The my problem was that whenever like there's a sex scene in a movie, you know, you feel a little tingle. You feel mm. like okay, like I might have sex today. <laughs> I look, I look at you, and I'm like, mm, Simon looks good. <laughs> so you know, you have that little little bit of something that's going on inside of you. But with mm. this scene, I didn't feel that. Yeah, I wasn't like, oh yeah, like you know. Let me do it. And it's supposed to be an erotic thriller. And I just felt like the erotic scenes weren't doing it for me. And I don't know if that was because of like the badness of the movie uh-huh. or maybe it's the lack of connection between two main characters. Uh-huh. I don't know what it was, but it was just wasn't doing it. Or maybe yeah. I was just too focused on like Zaire, like just giving... Mia, like, you know, urinal infection. Know. <laughs> Once again, I think it is a lot about, you know, who Zaire was and how their relationship was. Uh, you know, it was very toxic. And plus, it was very gross how it started. So it's sort of like how when we watch Jungle Fever and we're not rooting for Flip and uh, what was the Italian girl's name? I forgot. Me too. Uh, Yeah, but it's like you're watching Jungle Fever and you don't want Flip and his mistress to succeed because they've started off on a very bad foot, right? So you don't 
want that romance to win. And it's sort of like the same thing here. When they do have sex, it's not the cathartic release where you're like, ah, yes, all that sexual tension that was right between these two who are so compatible is happening. It's like you're watching, you know, two very dysfunctional people bumping their genitalia against each other in bright colors. Yeah, maybe that. But I mean, I can, I feel like there was potential there if yeah. it was like done right, because Zaire was supposed to be bad boy artist, you know, he had those sexy qualities, but it didn't make him sexy. <laughs> there was one scene where Zaire showed like his player side and he did have some charm. It was the scene when Zaire came into the uh, office uh, to meet with Mia uh, and he was like, I can't be in here, all these niggas in suits, I need to be somewhere where I can breathe, somewhere I can relax, and Mia's like, uh, okay, so where do you want to meet? He's like, I don't know, I'll, I'll call you later, something like that, and then as he's walking away, he says, I see them jeans, and I'm like, yep, that's player, that's player right there, I, yeah. I, I respect that. <laughs> that's Definitely. Such a <laughs> <laughs> that's a line right there. I see them jeans. You know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, that was definitely like that scene was sexier than the painting scene. Yeah. Uh, and also like the scene that you say, like he, like Maya is talking to her husband mm -hmm. right before like uh, Zaire shows up and Zaire touches Maya on her back. Mm. And they show that they did they do a close up there, so you see it, and it's like you know, women like those little touches, you know, yeah. when men touch the small of our backs and stuff like that. So that was definitely like, you know, more um, I don't know, attractive than yeah. all the other scenes, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now going back to like who this movie is for, I think the sex scene, the eroticness of this film is what I think is driving interest for this movie and also who I think this movie is for. Because I think this movie is attempting to make erotic uh, film uh, fiction for Black people, particularly Black women, because, you know, everybody enjoys Fifty Shades of Grey and all the other erotic films that have come out, right? Like all the passion flicks movies and stuff like that. But those are, you know, very white movies. And the thing is, you know, I feel like even though this film is raceless, meaning that race is not something that is a, is a part of the subplot or any part of the story, right? I think what this film is trying to do is create that sort of narrative or sort of art that can exist in, for Black people. Like, you know, uh, damn, what was that movie with uh, Shannon Stone that was popular back in the day? Uh, uh, basic instinct or something like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Where she sits in the chair, cross-legged and stuff like that. Like, I feel like in black cinema, we don't have that many, you know, erotic thrillers, erotic dramas, you know, uh, for us. Right. And I think that's because of like the, 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 the self, how can I say the self uh, barriers we put on ourselves as a people because of the white gaze around us. And also maybe, you know, they didn't think that there would be a way to market that because maybe, you know, black people aren't into BDSM. Black people aren't into, you know, body paint sex scenes, right? Uh, black people aren't into, you know, uh, a Mr. Gray type character or a Mr. Gray type character might be too problematic to put on screen because, you know, America or the world isn't ready to see a black man who ties up women in chains and whips on them and then has sex, right? Like Fifty Shades of Grey, I don't think would be as popular if Mr. Grey was Mr. Black, honestly. Let's keep that absolutely real. So yeah. I think, yeah, okay, so you agree. <laughs> I don't no. Know if, I don't know if I, that's problematic you agree or not, but go ahead. I do agree, like in the sense that what you're saying is factual because I just thought of this uh, two movies, Magic mm -hmm. Mike mm -hmm. and Chocolate City. Mm -hmm. Now everyone knows Magic Mike, Mm -hmm. And yes, there is, I think, like either a Latino or maybe even a black stripper in Magic Mike. But mm -hmm. it, the story's main character is white and most of the other like guys in the movie are white. Now, mm -hmm. they made a black version of this movie called Chocolate City. Mm -hmm. And I doubt that a lot of people saw that. Like I even just watched it like very randomly just scrolling and I was like, okay, like, let me watch this, 
You know, it's just like it's, it's, okay, it's okay to say you enjoy Chocolate City and Magic Mike. You're a woman. You're a heterosexual woman, so you don't have to be like, yeah, yeah I just happened to watch it. It's okay to say I went for that. <laughs> no, I did went for that, but I wasn't like. You know, when women watch these movies, they're not like, oh, okay, let me get ready to masturbate and watch Chocolate City. It's not like that, <laughs> Simon. <laughs> like, it's like, I don't know, guys watching Baywatch or something. Right. So it's like, yeah, like you're interested in seeing like, yes, beautiful, sexy men. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, my point is like, yeah, like th those two types of movies were made and we know which one is the most popular one. That's yeah, all yeah. I wanted to like point out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, exactly. And I think a lot of that has to do with like, you know, Fifty Shades or Magic Mike's budget compared to like the Chocolate City or, you know, any other small black tubey erotic thriller movie that exists. Right. And uh, I feel like, you know, we want to have those movies where we can be as nasty as we want to be or as dark as we want to be with sexuality or explore different parts of it. But in black cinema, that road, I feel like hasn't hasn't been crossed yet, in my opinion. Like the closest I've seen is like something about the Johnsons, which is a short film, uh, which is very good. One of my favorite films of all time. Uh, but, you know, it still has yet to be done, right? In a way I feel like is big and in your face and everywhere and you know about it and nothing's coming to mind. And if anybody knows of any black erotic thrillers or black erotic dramas, that have been successful, let me know, right? But we're just now getting good black horror movies, right? So I think it might be some time before we get good black erotic thrillers, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And even like with other genres of movies and uh, like their black versions and stuff like that, I feel like they are a bit... Like, um, they do share most of the time a common theme or they do make like, um, not, not make, but they do kind of fit the same sort of box. I don't know if that, like black comedy movies. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I feel like, mm, I don't know. Most of them have jokes about being black or about white people or I don't know about racism even. Mm -hmm. and they're like sort of around that realm or maybe like it's about pimping or you know smoking weed and stuff like that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if that makes sense right. uh but yeah so it's like they're still in those stereotypes still in those boxes right and i feel not like, all of them i yeah, would not, say but most of them yeah 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 and so i don't know i feel like with with this film hopefully you know tyler can continue to grow and continue to be, uh, you know, making films because he is making, it is something to be happy about that there is this black writer, director, producer who is making all of these movies in his own studio with his own money, with, you know, black staff and, you know, he's able to create his vision outside of Hollywood and still get it out there to the people. I'm happy to see that, right? But, uh, you know, I feel like what's being done on Tubi, which I feel like this movie is more suited to, they're pushing the boundaries more. And Tubi has a lot of bad movies, <laughs> but it also has some, you know, interesting films. Like, he's for the streets, right? And, you know, you, if, if you're going to make a B-type movie, it cannot take itself seriously. Because if it takes itself seriously, like this one, it's going to flop, right? And it doesn't have any quality that makes you want to go back, you know? Unless you want to watch something really bad. Does that make sense? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I get it, yes. Maybe, mm. like, this movie could have been a parody or something. Mm. Uh, but at the same time, it does enable, like, other artists, other screenwriters to write something similar and hopefully better yeah. than this. Because I don't know if you can make worse. Mm -hmm. uh, but, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think we'll wrap it up here. But overall, my... Complaints about this movie have been lengthy, <laughs> but I'll give one piece of props for this film. You know, uh, uh, the, the main actor, whoever played the brother, the DA, uh, he was great. Kelly Rowland should continue to act, but maybe find more challenging roles, interesting roles, or maybe do some supporting roles 
to get her skills up. Uh, the, 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 the budget and the scenery and some of the shots were really cool. And uh, yeah, uh, much love to Shannon Horton. She's dope. We need that P-Valley 3. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to read this comment that we both found hilarious from Letterboxd. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is from IKT Gene. And he said, he gave it a half star. Half a star only because I adore Kelly Rowland. Bias aside, this was not good by any standard. Tyler Perry continues his reign of terror against cinema. <laughs> <laughs> Badly paced, poorly written, awful performances. Black audiences deserve better. How he manages to get away with the constant mediocrity is the only interesting thing about his work. I hope he uses his powers for good one day and stop terrorizing audiences with his nonsense. Wow, terror. The word terror. <laughs> yeah, basically in Letterbox, everyone refers to him as a terrorist. Wow, wow. But nobody's made the joke yet. This is Tyler, the non-creator. <laughs> Nobody said that yet? No? Okay. I'll be the first. <laughs> I'll be the first to say it. Are those crickets? Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> how, did, how, did, <laughs> how did you get that so fast? I'm good. Oh, wow. That was great. Uh, yeah, but, um, yeah, a lot of hate for this movie, but I feel like people just want something to hate on. It's easy to hate from the sidelines, so Tyler Perry, keep trying. Kelly, keep trying. But we got to give this movie a good, solid four. I'll give it a four. Yeah, I think it's the same for me. It's a four. Now, is this the worst movie we've seen this year, though? Because I would still say Bottoms was a bit worse. Uh... I think I'm going to say Bottoms was not worse. Wow. Okay. Because maybe as an experience, they were the same for me. Mm -hmm. But when we looked deeper into Bottoms, at least it was a parody. Mm -hmm. And there, were like a, there was a deeper thought into it. And I feel like I'm missing it with this one. Okay. Okay, okay. I feel like maybe if we watch Bottoms again, maybe I would appreciate it more. Uh, maybe I could laugh again at some jokes, but overall it was just very annoying to watch. <laughs> I just remember <laughs> feeling so annoyed about certain scenes and jokes and just like, this is not working. This is not working at all. <laughs> yeah, I guess. But I mean, they were both like not very enjoyable, but at least, I don't know, like <laughs> Bottoms was trying to do something. Bottoms was trying to do something. All right. Well, either way, thank you all for listening to this live stream for this movie review. This has been Mia Culpa, episode 33. We got a bunch of other films coming along the way, so stay tuned. Subscribe to Backpack Bandits. Follow me on uh, Twitter, Laji and uh, Go to Spotify and play our episodes uh, they're called Cinema Crossroads. And of course, subscribe to Simon Hill Keeps a Trill and peace.